Hi, everyone. I hope you're having fun today. So any ideas on what this is? I guess you have a hint now. Yeah, exactly. This is a bacterium. So it's invisible to the naked eye. But if we zoom in our view over 22,000 fold, we can see it in a picture just like this. And as you can see from the scale bar, it's just one micrometer in length, so it's really tiny. But despite being so tiny, bacteria and other microbes can do really amazing things. They usually have a bad rep, right? Because they contaminate our food and they make us sick. But there are other reasons why we're interested in bacteria today, and other microbes too. And the reason is that they're redefining the way that we're thinking about our bodies and redefining how we think about what it means to be ourselves. So if you just take a look at these pictures here, it turns out that our bodies are comprised of trillions and trillions of microorganisms that cover every exposed body site, from our skin, which is obvious, but also our GI tracts, our guts, our mouths, and even some of them in our lungs. And so there's this idea now that we've co-evolved as humans with lots of different bacteria that are now part of us. And these all together, bacteria, viruses, and even fungi and other microbes, are called the human microbiota. So these microbes, as I said, live on every exposed body surface. But here are some numbers. It's estimated that in the gut, there are 100 trillion of them just bacteria alone, not counting viruses and other things. And on the skin, one trillion, mouth, 10 billion. And if you just compare this to the estimated number of people in the world, which is just seven um, billion, uh, you can see that we actually have a whole world of microbes or even a universe of microbes that's just inside and on ourselves. These microbes even outnumber our own cells, so there's so many of them that it's estimated that bacteria alone outnumber our own human eukaryotic cells 10 to 1. And for every human gene that we have, there are hundreds and hundreds of microbial genes that we have. So potentially, these genes can do a lot of things for our normal health and disease. So also, there are many different types of bacteria um, and, and other microbes, too. But just bacteria alone, there's estimated over 10,000 unique species. If we just compare this to the number of disease-causing bacteria that are known, so 80, and only 16 of which are considered priority pathogens from the center of disease control, what we only learned in the past five to 10 years is that there are all of these thousands and thousands of bacteria that are in our normal bodies, and we know very little about what they do. So it's even estimated, this is kind of a fun fact, if it's even estimated if you take all of these microbes on our bodies and pack them together, that they would weigh the size of a pretty hefty organ, up to six pounds. And if you compare this, brain is only 2.6 pounds, heart less than one pound, so there's a lot of potential for learning about how important these guys are. So many, many labs are interested in the microbiota right now and studying all of the potential ways they can influence our health and disease. And it turns out that they actually do many different things. So what's probably most obvious is microbes, which there are a lot of them in our guts, they influence our digestion, how we break down our food, and how we get our nutrients and energy metabolism. But interestingly, microbes also influence our immune systems. So even nowadays, or now actually, you can identify, scientists can identify certain bacteria that either promote inflammation or suppress inflammation. These microbes can even influence our responses to medicine. So how we respond to such normal things like Tylenol, acetaminophen, and how we break them down and, and, um, and, and respond to it. And as you can imagine, then, our, our susceptibilities to different diseases. So um, I'm a prof professor at UCLA, and I run a lab, and we're interested in this particular area of how microbes can actually impact our brain and behavior. And this is actually kind of a weird idea at first, but maybe not so weird. So if, has anyone ever gotten sick or food poisoning or something like that? You can immediately feel something, and be your behavioral changes. So, 
The idea that microbes, pathogens, can affect our, our brain behavior is, is not new. But what about microbes that are in us and on us right now? Are they doing anything in terms of influencing our brain health and disease? So there are a lot of little um, pieces of evidence from animal studies that make us interested in this area. And they're really simple to start. And so here's one study where in the lab, we can take mice and give them different behavior tests. And here we give a testing mouse the chance to interact with another mouse, so to be social and hang out with another mouse, or to just be in another room that has a toy, an, a non-social object. And mice, which are usually social, social animals, prefer um, interacting with the other mouse. But if you just take away all of the microbes that live in and on this mouse, you see that we actually decrease sociability in this white bar right here. And then if you put back the microbes, then you can increase and make these, back, uh, these mice social again. And so this is really powerful, and we're studying how, which bacteria influence sociability, um, how do they interact with each other, how do they interact with neural circuits to, to influence sociability. Here's another study along the same lines. It's a really simple one. You could take a mouse and just measure how long it takes to step down or venture down from this really tall platform. And so here, there's two different lines of mice. There are two different breeds. Um, and one is usually low anxiety, so they step down or jump down from this platform real fast. And this other one is high anxiety, so it takes a long time. If we just take their microbes and swap them, what you can see is that the low anxiety mouse now has uh, more anxiety, so it takes longer to step down. And the other one that has high anxiety now takes a lower time uh, to step down. And so this is work done by Stephen Collins group. And so this is potentially really interesting, exactly. So are there particular microbes that we can find that influence this behavior, and how do they do it? And lastly, this is one uh, work that I did as a student, um, actually. So we were measuring mouse communication. So I'm not talking about like squeaking that you might hear from mice or you might be imagining, but it turns out that mice talk to each other in the ultrasonic range, kind of like bats. So if we use a special microphone, we can detect all these spectra of mice talking to each other. And in this study, what we did was take a mouse model for a neurological disorder, where in white here, these mice exhibit decrease, so very, they give very few calls, and they give very short calls. And what we did was we identified certain bacteria from the normal microbiome that actually can correct this deficit and actually make these mice communicate more. So it's been really exciting, and these are animal models, but what about in humans? Is there any evidence that bacteria can influence brain function or behavior? And so here's one study. This was done by Emmer and Meyer's group at UCLA. And what they did was take healthy humans and just treat them with a cocktail of, bacteria, of, of particular bacteria. And then they did brain imaging, so functional MRI, to measure activity in different brain regions. And what they saw is all of these different brain areas light up and um, change in response to just exposure to different bacteria. So there's some evidence there that we're on the right track where there's something interesting in, for this biology. Now, what's the point? So there are lots of different disorders, and all of these have roots in different areas, so uh, immune problems, GI problems, heart problems, but all of these disorders are also linked to changes in the microbiota. We know this now, that if we profile individuals with disorders, they have differences in the microbiota. And people, our lab included, are really interested in whether microbes are involved in any of these pathologies, or if they're just a side effect. And there's some really exciting work about microbes being able to treat certain diseases. And so we're entering this era now of a new line of treatments where there are normal bacteria that potentially, imagine if we could treat people with these, they would colonize, they would stay and persist so you don't have to keep dosing, you don't have to do a very invasive treatment. Um, and potentially, you can get rid of them, engineer them to target certain places, sense different molecules, and it's really exciting. Um, 
from brain disorders, this is not, uh, this is kind of in the future, but today, these types of treatments are being in entered into the clinic for other disorders like GI problems and immune problems. And so I think there's a really exciting future now of live biotherapeutics, or at least learning from these microbes that are normally part of ourselves and what they do on a normal day-to-day -day basis. And so with that, I want to just leave you with this message that in biology class, we learned that we all live in a microbial world, right? That microbes help cycle nutrients and energy and make our environment and the earth habitable. And they're actually a part of, you know, food and agriculture and bioremediation. But aside from living in a microbial world, we actually, in some ways, are a microbial world. We have so many microbes that are an important part of us, and this is a world that's yet to be explored. And so I hope that some of you might consider um, being explorers for this area of a world that's invisible to the naked eye. Thanks very much. So uh, I have a question for you. So what future technology do you wish you had right now to help with your research? Yeah, that's a really great question. So this area is so new that we don't even know how to culture all of these microbes in the lab, and we don't know exactly what they do. And so a technology that I would love right now is some way to parse all of these microbes and functionally screen them to test what they do. And in the future, maybe we can then understand what constitutes something that's healthy, what, some, what constitutes something that's unhealthy, and have technologies to actually change or replace or target certain microbes. Cool, thank you. Thanks.